Support for LAist comes from HBO, presenting The White Lotus. The social satire returns for a second season to follow the exploits of guests and employees at an exclusive Sicilian resort. Created, written, and directed by Mike White, and starring Jennifer Coolidge, F. Murray Abraham, Michael Imperioli, and Aubrey Plaza. Decider called the series a resounding triumph. Emmy eligible for outstanding drama series and all other categories. At the end of this podcast, you can hear comments from Jennifer Coolidge and Haley Lou Richardson about season two. Support comes from Cal Poly Pomona. Transform your career with a master's degree from their College of Business Accountancy program and STEM-based programs in business analytics or digital supply chain management. One year accelerated plan available. Visit cpp.edu slash cba. LAist Studios. This is How to LA. I'm Brian De Los Santos. I recently had the pleasure of sitting down with artist River Garza. He's a local dude, born and raised in the South Bay, but his whole body of work goes back to his roots, his ancestors. Garza's been steeped in the customs and beliefs of his Tonga and Mexican heritage since birth. And he said that his, quote, artistic practice is inseparable from all of that. And that's what we talked about, the ways in which our cultural identities shape and inform how we show up in the world. We talked about honoring that past and keeping traditions alive in the present. It was a pretty cool conversation. His work, Water, Bringer of Life and Community, is currently part of the Waterways exhibit at the Autry Museum of the American West. That's where we met up, at the museum, for a special LAist in-person event. Let's listen. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the host of How to L.A., Brian De Los Santos. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Um, okay. Well, I'm so happy to be here with you guys and share the stage with an amazing artist. Uh, again, if you guys have not checked out his exhibit at the Waterways exhibit, please do that. Come back to the Autry. River Garza is an artist from Los Angeles, California, whose work draws on traditional indigenous aesthetics, Southern California indigenous maritime culture, skateboarding, graffiti, Mexican culture, and low rider culture. Please welcome River today. All right, hello, everyone. So I want to kick things off with you, River, just talking about your work experience and who you are as an artist. Let's just start there right, from the beginning. Sure. Um, I consider myself an interdisciplinary artist. I work um, across quite a few mediums. I consider painting my medium of choice, um, but I also dabble in the realm of public art, uh, muralism, a little bit of silversmithing, uh, and on occasion, writing, but uh, consider myself a painter. And when we were talking about this event, um, you noted when you had a catalyst into your now aesthetic in 2016, 2017. Tell us what happened then? Yeah, I think 2016, 2017 was a real transformative period of my life. Um, I was in school at the time. I'm a graduate of Cal Poly Pomona. And yeah, during that time, I <laughs> happened to change my major to gender, ethnic, and women's studies. And was um, my emphasis was in, in Native American studies. So during that time, it was a, a, a big, uh, big change for me. Prior to that, I was majoring in, in economics and thought I wanted to go... Um, to be, to be an economist and get into like economic consulting and stuff like that. So a real radical shift of what I, well, a life trajectory and what I thought I wanted to do. So just to interject here, you didn't yeah. grow up like, I want to be an artist, mom, dad. You, didn't, you weren't that kid. I was, but I think I was afraid and quite un unsure how to go about pursuing the career of an artist. I grew up in a, a working class community. I'm from the South Bay. I grew up in Gardena from, yeah, working class family. So I think those type of things um, were kind of, seemed far-fetched at the time. I couldn't quite envision myself doing it. It was like, it almost felt like a deep, dark secret, like something I always wanted to pursue but didn't quite know how to go about it and felt afraid. And um, so, yeah, during that time, I embarked on, you know, changing my career trajectory and really, I think, starting to dive deeper into, I guess, like the academic side of things, but also at that time, like starting to embrace the identity of, of artists and saying, I'm an artist. Um, which was, was which is a huge thing. I think like em embracing that and having that become a part of who I am was um, was transformative. I think like my schoolwork conceptually informs a lot of what I produce. 
And at the same time, I also have been able to find mentors in, in the art realm as, as well. Um, I was able to connect with a Pueblo artist. His name is Jake Fragua. Um, he's been a huge inspiration and helped guide me early on in my career in terms of embracing my identity as an artist and feeling comfortable moving forward and navigating the world as, as an artist. Um, so that was like a really big thing, I think, getting that affirmation from people that I look up to, that I'm inspired by their work, really helped solidify and make me feel comfortable moving forward and, and embracing that, that identity as an artist and, and yeah, and creating things. I love that you spoke about your community of folks who have helped you become this artist that you are now, right? So intersectional identity, it's something that um, you've spoken about, I speak about on the podcast sometimes, um, and I really just want to dig into that. Um, I love what you say on your website. Um, you've already shared about, a bit about who you are, but I want to read this directly from your website. It's a statement. It says, my artistic practice is inseparable from my Tonga heritage. I am an, am I going to butcher this word? Sorry, I'm an ESL kid, okay? <laughs> I'm an amalgamation of centuries of resistance, forced assimilation, and resettlement, and my work reflects those disjointments of memory, tradition, and identity. That is very deep. Can you unravel that for us a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I say that, I think who I am is, uh, again, this, like a, a multiplicity of things. Um, grew up like very much deeply rooted in the Tongva community here and the native community in Southern California and understanding that, but also um, grew up in the Mexican community too. And having, um, at, I think earlier on, it felt like a duality of sorts, but as I've gotten older and really start to understand myself, my place in this city and um, learning more about my, my, my family's history, uh, it feels like, um, I don't know, all these different separate parts that create a whole. And yeah, I don't know. It's, it's hard to articulate. Um, growing up, I'm sure many folks can resonate to this experience, but it seems like coming from a multicultural background, a lot of times people want to put you in a box. It's so cliche to say that, but it, it feels so true. And I think at times I feel like I had to compartmentalize aspects of my identity. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've learned to embrace all of them simultaneously, which I think took a lot of time um, and yeah, it's just, I feels, uh, it feels powerful to, to be there at this point in time and not feel like I have to isolate one aspect of myself or I'm a, a monolith of things. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a multiplicity. I'm an intersection of all kinds of different families, tribal communities, experiences, both here and abroad. And so embracing that and understanding that is, has been a beautiful thing and seeing um, the parallels of past experiences of my ancestors and how they inform what I do now, both creatively, conceptually, is... Um, it's a beautiful thing, so yeah. I had a really similar experience when I was in Mexico and I went to the Museo of Antropologia and it was straight in the face of like, this is my history. I've never really felt my history that way. You know, I grew up in the 90s and 2000s here in LA and um, at that point there wasn't a lot of like Mexican proudness or Chicano like proudness um, and it was like I had to learn all that in college um, so it wasn't really I really didn't delve into my history when it came to indigenous cultures and in, in Mexico or even here in California um, but when I went to that museum I'm like wow the this is where I come from do you have a moment where you're like oh okay makes sense for me I feel like those moments happen all the time. It's kind of hard to pinpoint one thing. I think oftentimes, especially as I've gotten older, like exploring more of the city has really opened my eye to, to that, to feeling this sense of home. I think my sense of home has grown. I feel more attached to, to LA, I think, now than ever. But yeah, I think like it's, it's powerful to learn, at least for me, like the history of my, my family, what our place is here um, in terms of like my connection to the Tongva community, my Mexican side, um, where, how far we've come, and how I'm, like, it's just a beautiful thing to be able to sit here now. I, like, I reflect on the past. Um, like, I think of my grandmother, who I never had the fortune to meet, but, like, just a few generations ago, like, our family was, like, picking fruit. And thinking about sitting up here in an institution like this was probably far-fetched. And, like, here I am now. It's, it's, um, it's incredibly powerful. And to think of all of the, the hard work, dreams, and aspirations that, um, you know, that put me where I am. And so I think I feel like an immense sense of gratitude, too. 
And I try to reflect on that as, as much as I can. And like I said, I think like these moments happen all the time. Like I feel inspired and like empowered seeing folks from the com like community outside of myself doing things. And like, wow, look, like probably even like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, a lot of, a lot of like, you know, stuff wouldn't have happened, especially like in the art realm, like where we are now, like, um, it's incredibly powerful to see all kinds of indigenous artists working across all different mediums and, um, just doing beautiful things and, and really, really utilizing their voice and having the space and support from, you know, the community itself and also institutions, um, wanting to work with us. I agree with you when you say that um, there are several moments in life when you learn who you are, whether it's through your identity and your work and or even a, a moment or, or even the land you're on. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I share this in my podcast um, on how to L.A. Um, I was driving with a friend in Mexico City and he was like, uh, we're talking just about like how I sound because my Spanish sounds very pocho. Um, pocho means like an Americanized Mexican. Um, if you know, for those who don't know, who's who else is a pocho here? Okay, hey, <laughs> pochos y pochas and pochex. Um, I love that, love that. Um, so I, you know, he was kind of shading me, and he was just like, "Girl, you're 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 a gringo," and I'm like, "I'm not gringo. I'm not white." He's like. Gringo means American, and I'm like, you're right, okay. But I'm like, no, I'm undocumented. Like, I'm, I'm, I don't have, you know, a green card in the U.S. And, you know, I'm like more Mexican, right? He's like, yeah, look at you. You sound American. You look American. I'm like, I'm, I'm browner than you. And he's like, no. He's like, you gotta realize that we will love you as Mexican, as your Mexican people. This is your raza. This is your paisanos. But you are American. And in that car ride, we were on our way to Coyacan, which is this small town right outside of Mexico City. And um, I had to reflect it and I'm like, I've always not wanted to feel American because I'm undocumented. I've like always like rejected that thought. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not American. I'm not, you know, that type of dude or I don't want to like leave my roots behind. And then I'm like, well, you know, actually I am like, I know that the paper doesn't say that I'm American. You know, I don't have like, a passport that's in the U.S., but I'm pretty much a pocho, you know, I'm an Americanized, ver Americanized version of Mexican. And um, I kind of embrace that, you know, that was my moment of like, fuck it, I am a pocho, <laughs> you know. Um, and I wrote a little essay for Elias as well about that and having that moment of embrace. Um, and, you know, I think we were talking about that just earlier, how land or where we're at also impacts our identities or who we are. And so I want to take it over to where we're at right now, which is Los Angeles. It is Tonga land. It is where a lot of people come here to start their new lives as immigrants. It is um, people who have been here for forever, where the border has crossed them. Um, and I want to show something on the screen here, which is your, um, your art and it's titled My Home. Can we just start off the, this part of the conversation of like what it is and- Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this piece was made in, I believe 2019. I was um, fortunate enough to have a residency at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I painted that there. It sounds like funny. I was only out there for three weeks, but no matter how far, I, I, like, I love to travel, but I always get like homesick. And during that time being there, being far away from home, thinking about my parents, my family, um, decided to make this. I, I kind of view this as like almost like an abstract landscape of sorts. But um, yeah, I think it's a, I view it aesthetically as like a drawing on all of my eclectic interests. I grew up like doing graffiti. Um, that was like a big part of, of my life and my, I would say like informal introduction to like public art and, and creating. Um, and that's, that's like a big part of, I guess like my, my praxis and how I conceptualize making art is, is really coming from that. Um, but also like the imagery and like the words you see on here are to me like reflections of home. There's like a little snippet of like a Kendrick Lamar lyric up there. Um, there's like lettering and stuff too. That really comes from like, I mean, all over the city, there's all kinds of advertisements, um, especially like in the South Bay and all, all over the town, you see like signs and things like that too. So that's like a big influence. Um, so yeah, drawing on all of the, uh, the art that we see in the streets. It's, it's rather cliche, but I think it, um, it really informs who I am. Like, uh, I love like 
uh, <laughs> the kind of like, I don't say esoteric art, but like outsider art you see like in working class communities, like little handmade signs that someone's like the I made or something like that, or someone's mm -hmm. cousin. Like I love that type of stuff. And so to me, this type of work draws on all of that. It's a, it's a reflection of home. It's a, I don't know, a little piece of, of how I feel and, and what it means to be here for me. We'll get more into that after the break. Support comes from Cal Poly Pomona. Launch your career in Masters of Digital Supply Chain Management, one of the fastest growing fields globally. With its STEM designation, Cal Poly Pomona's MS Digital Supply Chain Management Program is designed with a focus on in-depth supply chain functional area knowledge within the context of digital transformation. Students in the MSDSCM program learn from faculty experts and project-based activities that will shape their knowledge and skills through holistic digital transformation views. Learn more at cpp.edu slash cba. This podcast is supported by the Norton Simon Museum, presenting all-consuming art and the essence of food, now on view. This expansive exhibition explores how artists responded to and shaped food cultures in Europe from the 16th to 20th centuries. With depictions of luscious fruits and vegetables, sumptuous feasts and bustling markets, food and drink appear nearly everywhere in the history of European art. All-consuming examines a range of relationships with eating and drinking, both positive and negative. More info at nortonsimon.org. You're listening to How to LA. I'm Brian De Los Santos. You know, it's funny. I was scrolling through the artwork that you sent. And even before I saw the, L the Los Angeles, which kind of looks like a play on the LA Times uh, logo and Absolutely. stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, this sounds, this looks like a, a reflection of where uh, you were at a certain point in your life that um, you gravitated towards the city. I'm like, it, it, the, the lettering up there, which is, you know, this pink or, you know, this pink peach maybe uh and blue um says you're next uh ain't no city like quite like mine you know that lyric that's yeah. all this is all beautiful and Thank um you. It, i feel like even though we don't know each other that well like it it reflects some a feeling of mine right um i think uh i want to touch about like you trying to navigate the art world in 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 la or in southern california and how that's been for you because if someone's listening to this and like oh i I've never heard someone who's indigenous and Mexican and shared these identities with me. And I want to make my art like he does. Like, what would you, you know, how, how did you navigate that art Ooh. world here in SoCal? Yeah, I love that question. Um, I think it took a long time to, to find the answer to that. But I think as I've gotten older and be able to connect with folks, and again, I really stress the idea of, of mentorship, connecting with folks and really like expressing how you feel because it's, it's hard. Um, to figure out your place in, in, in the Western art world, right? Because I think like so much of our traditions um, are rested in like creating things. A lot of the times in the past, I think of like the artwork that's on like ceramics, bowls, baskets, like things with like utilitarian purposes. So I think a lot of that still translates to, to what we do now. Um, but I think like the most important thing is this notion of like embracing who you are. I think that's so important and it's, it's hard to get to that point, but it's, it's so crucial and just know like, I think if there's like a word of advice I can give is like trust in your vision. I think that's really important. I think there's a space for whatever it is you have to say and that people will, will find value in that and you should find value in that. Um, in, in making something, there's something incredibly empowering in that and something that takes back to our, to our ancestors. Like I love like the idea of that that I still continue a practice that has been going on since, since time immemorial. But the things that I'm trying to articulate and express are different now. Like looking at this piece in particular, like a lot of it is reflective of home. Like I also try and use like humor as a device to talk about, um, I guess it would be like colonialism, capitalism, um, and the issues that go on within Indian country. So a lot of that I think is all playing into what I want to talk about and also at the same time I think for me like the work that I'm doing um, and how I try to conceptualize things is also thinking about like my own place um, in like the art in like the art world or the canon of art and how I want to participate in image making I think it's incredibly important um, and something that's that's relatively new like painting is like a renaissance activity and like our people have only been able to engage in this for a relatively short period of time in terms of like um, like studio painting and, and whatnot. So being able to use that and finally separate ourselves as like the object and now being able to be the person uh, or be able to create things and have the opportunity to art articulate ideas, concepts is, uh, is powerful. And I think we live like right now in a time where there's so much amazing work going on from 
people across the world were able to connect and see what people are doing on a global scale, which is amazing. And I find it empowering and humbling to see parallels of people like even across the world, or it could be states away and talking about similar ideas, issues, um, especially like from an indigenous perspective and how that, that resonates across time and place. Yeah, your art really shows it, like your intersectional, you know, identities, and it does play into a Los Angeles. For me, it's, I like to say LA is a playground for your identity and who you are and who you want to be. You are able to be on the West Side and have some type of fun there. You're able to, like, work in a studio in the arts district like mm -hmm. you do. Um, <laughs> you're able to, like, drive elsewhere. You're able to go to the, you know, do outdoor stuff. So I do think that... Um, I'm just a homegrown Angelino, and I just love the city as as, as well as you do. We yeah. shared that earlier today. Um, but it also creates uh, a lot of um, coziness with other communities. And I think we were talking about like how you have tried to connect uh, what you do in the art world also back to the community. T tell me about like the communities that you enjoy learning from or spending time with, whether it is a place, like you said, you know, the South Bay, or Pomona for school, or, um, you know, uh, other pe types of folks yeah absolutely I think um, what I think about when I answer that is what resonates and where I enjoy spending the most time is like working class communities oh, I think we, we spoke about this briefly but I think there's this perception and it's it's true that like you know LA is very much like an, an industry town it's like the entertainment industry and I think there's this perception that uh like all of LA is like Hollywood and glitz and glamour but um, it's not quite that at all so, and I think like knowing that, like being able to spend time in different communities, working, creating art and getting to know these people. Like I really resonate with working class people, blue collar folks, people that have to get up and grind every single morning. And that's, um, that's important. You know, I think like, again, this outsider perspective of what it is to, to be here, to live in this space is um, radically different than the lives that a lot of people live. And so spending time in these communities um, is humbling and there's so much inspiration to be drawn and, especially as like a creative to see the creativity that goes on in these places. Like I always think of like graffiti, um, like coming from these working class communities, like having this desire, this creative capacity to, to want to make things, but maybe not having the means or, or know how to navigate, you know, the art world in these type of spaces. So like, I love that type of stuff. I, like I said, like little signs that like people make, like seeing things on the freeway, little, I don't know, uh, yeah, I guess that's what comes to mind. Do you remember when, I don't know, I want to name them taggers, but people who would do um, um, art on the post um, office stickers and <laughs> yeah. you would put them all over school or yeah. something like that? I don't know. That's how I grew up in L.A. That was my L.A., part of my L.A. But, yeah. you know, that art is everywhere. Yeah, and I definitely partake in that or did. You did that? Yeah, yeah, Don't, yeah. don't tell mom, is she? <laughs> <laughs> she already knows what's up. Okay, she already knows yeah, what's up. Yeah. Shout out to the families. Hey. <laughs> um, I want to touch upon tradition and history. Um, because you know yours and you come from, uh, you know, the Tonga tribe, but also Mexican, you have a Mexican family. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I come from Veracruz, Mexico, and, you know, our history is all over the map as well. So I don't know much of my history, but you do. So I want to lean into that and how you knowing so much of where you come from has shaped your art. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that question. And I think like, this notion of history and my family history has been like a, an important thing that's been stressed, um, not stressed, but something that's been embraced by like both of my parents. Um, and really as I've gotten older, like finding value in that. Uh, I mean, I've, I've always like understood, like it's one of those things that it sounds like funny, but I guess like as a kid, it almost seemed like passive information, like, yeah, 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 we're from here, we're this, we're that. And like, okay, cool. You know, but as I've gotten older, like a lot of it makes sense. And as, again, as I reflect like the position that like my grandparents were in, my great grandparents over here, my great, great parent, grandparents migrating over here, having to navigate that, or my ancestors, like on like the Tongva side of family, or like I said, I come from multiple tribes too. And then having to navigate that, like I think of again, how, how far we've come um, like it's, it's important, like knowing our, our history, our lineage is informs who we are as indigenous people, um, and how, how we should navigate life. And yeah, it's, it's an incredibly empowering to know. Again, I think of like, again, this notion of like how far we've come. I feel so like privileged to be sitting in this space right now, being able to talk to you is, is a beautiful thing. Cause I said like 50 years ago, this would not be happening. Like, I also think like, like my parents were born before the civil rights movement. You know what I mean? So they probably, they would not have an opportunity to do this. Like I am, uh, I get to, 
like reap the rewards of all of all of like generations of, of labor of sacrifice and just for me to be here today to be able to talk about these things to be in a space where i can articulate these type of ideas is um is beautiful and it makes me think of again our history um the strength that comes from that the resilience of our ancestors and also like thinking forward too i want to talk about kind of like honoring um your, your elders honoring your past honoring the family values that you bring that you come up with right um when i was in mexico i um this was my first time interacting with my abuelas um on certain levels right it was like my abuela making breakfast for me it was <laughs> going out in my little town and walking with my abuela to the store and buying like chicken and like veggies um and the one thing she would always like Every day, she's like, you know, honor your mom, honor this, honor this. This is your land. This is your hometown. I'm like, yes, abuela, I know, okay. You know, I felt like a little kid. She transported me back when I was like eight years old or something. Um, and here I am, a 32-year-old man. Um, but then I also understood like, oh, like um, their, hi their history is my history. But also, I, I am not them, them, you know. I'm a yeah. queer man. I'm in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm not necessarily them. So how do you honor where you come from while also being who you are at the same time within your art no that's a that's a deep question i love that well <laughs> you gotta get real yeah 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 <laughs> so i guess like one way um i honor my ancestors and my family is uh i don't know i guess like trying to navigate the world trying to be the best person that i can um i think also like this may sound silly and a little crass but like to not take art making lightly I think it's uh, it's a hard task. Um, it's incredibly challenging I, I, at times to articulate ideas and imagery that I think is respectful and responsible. And I've, and I've definitely made mistakes in the past of um, not doing that in terms of what I make, but but learning from that and trying to to navigate life as an artist in a good way and think about community and what I'm trying to articulate in my work and what I what I wanted to say. I think like again, thinking very critically of how I want to participate in image making. Because like the history of Western art has been, uh, <laughs> I love that, I love uh, that. that. That reaction says something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, not reflective of, of who we are. And so having the opportunity to, to create and articulate ideas is powerful. And again, not something to be taken lightly. So I, I take it with like a lot of seriousness. Yeah, I appreciate you taking time to answer that question because it was hard. <laughs> I was like, I'm going somewhere with this and hopefully he yeah. lands on something. <laughs> it is a hard question. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I kind of want to start opening up for questions mm -hmm. um, unless you want to share anything else. Um, this is your your mic. This is your stage. What would you want to share with the audience and people who I mean listening to the podcast? Definitely want to speak to all the artists out there, the folks that are maybe apprehensive of, of making things, afraid, have ideas they wanna talk about, make them. It's important. Um, be easy on yourself in the process of trying to learn your practice. And again, know that what you make has a place in this world. It's important and, and people will find value in it. So take that difficult step to, to create, but find and embrace the power in that. I think that's like a, I don't know, that's what's coming to mind. Oh, appreciate that, thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna start the question and answer uh, portion of the night. What is your perspective on the Latino diaspora identity and how it's changing beyond the geo geopolitical factors? Um, you wanna let everyone chew on that a little bit? Um, River, you kinda had a cool thing to say backstage. Yeah, I think this is a great essay question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> definitely something to mill over long term. Um, <laughs> But I guess what comes to mind when I think of that is uh, in the context of, of here in the United States, diaspora, I think this notion of identity is, is a multiplicity, is a plurality of things. I think that's important. I think there's, it makes me think of perhaps like maybe the way things are framed in the media as like a monolith of who folks are that come to this country from Latin America are, why they're here. Um, people come here for all kinds of different reasons. And I think that's, um, that's what comes to mind when I think about that is like, just this vast um, plurality of experiences from family histories to, you know, I think of like the reasons, like a lot of reasons people have come here is as the onset of like American imperialism and how that affects families generationally. Um, but yeah, I think uh, 
again, like this, this notion, this word keeps coming to mind is like this plurality, this um, all kinds of different ex experiences. It's not this, this monolith um, and that people make, make sense of place and home here. And I think that's a beautiful thing and how the intersection of that amongst different communities and contribute to the community that we have now and seeing it grow, embracing people as they come here and, and make their place and, and find a sense of home here is a beautiful and powerful thing. I think especially like here in, in LA, like having this be my ancestral homeland, um, but also sharing it with other people too is, uh, is beautiful. And I think what comes to mind when I think of that too, like from an indigenous perspective being here is um, this notion of like stewardship. Um, and really embracing that role and sharing those ideas with other communities as they come here and we, we share space. A plus from this professor <laughs> on this side of the you know, oh, table. Um, th that, that was a hard question. We like uh, talked about it yeah. and we both agreed as like, I, I, when I first read you know, geopolitical factors, it's like for me it's a border, right? Yeah. It's like the apparent thing of, of what's happening and actually I have a friend who is in the audience and she just came back from reporting on the border and Title 42. So, you know, that's apparent to me um, of how the Latino diaspora and our identities like rooted from whether it's a border or if the border crossed us, Californios, it is Chican Chicanos, it is all of, all of this. And just going back to your answer is like, we're not a monolith, you know, yeah. even being Mexican or Mexican American, we're, we're not, you know, mm -hmm. we're not all the same. Um, Pocho, you self-identify as something different. We have Pretty some sort of crossing <laughs> yeah. there, but you know we're, we're different identities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for everyone who came out today. I appreciate you showing up, and thank you, River. Like thank this you. was amazing. Again, like someone said, uh, talking about identity is hard. Um, it's not easy. I'm on Twitter and I always talk shit about everything. So for me, it kind of comes naturally. Um, but it is hard. It is yeah. hard. And then, you know, sharing your art and you're sharing yourself with the world. And you're also sharing history, whether it's family or your land or, you know, or truth just about yourself. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone who braved LA traffic to be here today. Cool. Well, I think um, there is still a DJ outside. There will be music. Um, that was my conversation with LA artist River Garza at the Autry Museum of the American West. His artwork is currently on display as part of the museum's waterways exhibit. You can catch a video of our chat and additional event information at elias.com slash events. Okay, y'all, that's it for us this week. Have a great weekend. We'll get back to you on Tuesday. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. Support for LAS comes from HBO, presenting The White Lotus. The social satire returns for a second season to follow the exploits of guests and employees at an exclusive Sicilian resort. Here are series stars Jennifer Coolidge, who plays Tanya McCoy, and Haley Lou Richardson, who plays Tanya's assistant, Portia. Well, Tanya, I think she means well. I think she wants to be loved. Yes. And you want that with Greg? <laughs> with anybody. Yes, with, with anyone, not, not just Greg. Our characters are very similar, actually. We both are very self-involved yes. in our own kind of pity yes. and problems. And we aren't self-aware of how we kind of fit into the big picture of life. I think I'm much more self-aware than you. You think Tanya's self-aware? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think when you're older, you can be a narcissist, but still know your incredible limitations. And I think when you're young, you don't even know they exist. I completely agree with that. I think that Portia thinks that she's not the problem. But here she is in Sicily, and she's just been told to get lost and basically not be an assistant anymore. But she takes it like the end of the world. That's the thing, too, about Tanya's version of, like, help and the thing she needs an assistant or I think in the first episode is the only time you really see Portia kind of being an assistant. Like she comes into the resort, like holding, you know, bags and telling the bellman where to put things. But then when you tell me to go to my room, I'm still kind of on call for you. But it's really just a lot of sitting in the other room while you're crying or like standing there. And which characters on the show would Jennifer and Haley most like to travel with? I think I would rather actually go alone than with any of the characters other than Lucia. She's very beautiful. I mean, she actually makes most people's trip better. I want to always go where there's everything is 
ancient. You know, I want to stay in some really old castle. When someone says like, oh my God, Jennifer, we got, we're going to go to this place. I, you know, we're renting this house and look at, we, we found it on a really cool website or like this. And I'm like, is it old? <laughs> because if it's not old and crumbling and cool, I have no interest. Jennifer Coolidge acted in both season one and season two of The White Lotus. What's the difference between them? White Lotus 2 has way more sex. I've asked to come and watch some of it. Um, <laughs> I mean, they said it's a closed set, but I was able to get in. Decider called the series a resounding triumph, Emmy eligible for outstanding drama series and all other categories. The White Lotus is now streaming on HBO. Ma, pa, te presento a mi novia Luna. Hola, mucho gusto. Eric Galindo, co-host of Wild here, and this season, I'm going to tell you a fictional love story. The type of story that feels like a movie. It was inspired by my life. The woman I was dating, off and on again for a minute, comes to me and says she wants to move to Milwaukee. You're looking at the newest anchor for YWCC News, baby! I'm going to be the face of Milwaukee's leading news source. It was a road trip adventure across America. I was steeped in love and in one of the most confusing relationships of my life. This is a Southeast LA rom-com. It's the kind of fictional audio drama that forces you to confront parts of yourself. From Alias Studios, listen to Wild Season 2, I Think I'm Falling in Love. Catch the new season on NPR One, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 